Coming up today on David versus Goliath. You gotta have one hairy eyeball on your business at all times. No wonder you spent a lot of time out there with the SEALs. <laughs> it's gonna get better and better as we go along. Thank you so much for watching. Welcome to today's episode of David vs. Goliath, a podcast dedicated to helping small businesses leverage technology to not only help them compete against their large competitors, but win. Your host is currently the CEO of Anthem Business Software, a free time Inc. 500 recipient and a serial entrepreneur with a passion to help small businesses everywhere find, serve, and keep more customers profitably. Please join me in welcoming your host, Adam DeGrade. Hey everyone, it's Adam DeGrade with another great edition of David versus Goliath, where the small guy takes on the big guy and wins here at DVG. We are so glad to have you. I'm your host, and it is, what a pleasure and a great day it's going to be because I have my business partner, one of my best friends, uh, Tim Sawyer. TimSawyer.com is his URL. Tim Sawyer is not only a fantastic business person, public speaker, trainer, he's very educated on how things are done in the business world, has counseled thousands and thousands of businesses on how to grow. And he's going to be here to talk to us today about what he's doing today in his life and what he's done also in the past. This is going to be a very educational, highly informative episode of David versus Goliath. Today's episode is brought to you by Anthem Software, built specifically for small businesses to help you find, serve, and keep more customers profitably with their all-in-one software, marketing, and consulting platform. Take the tour at anthemsoftware.com. It's about 120 seconds. You will not regret it. Also, pretty big breaking news. That's right. I'm now a published author. My first book, The Adventures of Jackson, The Young Field Mouse, just came out, available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. It's a story I've been telling my kids literally for 26 years. The illustrations are awesome. Let me just show you a few pages, give you guys an idea. Look at that. Awesome. And uh, what's really cool about it is Jackson gets lost, needs to find his mom and dad, and it teaches children three things, bravery, attentiveness, and gratitude. So check it out today. It's on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. Just type in Adam DeGrade in the search bar. Make sure you spell my last name right or you'll never find it. It's D-E-G-R-A-I-D-E, -E, and you'll find the book. If you buy it and you like it, leave me a review. It would mean a lot. Um, I know I thought my first book was going to be a business book, but it just makes sense to actually make this. A, yeah, this is a story I've been telling for 26 years to all my kids. So it's awesome, and I'm just glad to be able to share it with everyone. Hopefully, you enjoy it. Well, with that being said, make sure you can visit us today at davidvsgoliathpodcast.com, where you can subscribe and apply, and you can also ask DVG a question. Maybe you don't want to be on the podcast, but you want some help in your business. Go there, type in a question, send it to me, and I'll make sure that I get back to you at some point with an answer, hopefully. And I might even feature you on a future episode of David versus Goliath. Well, anyway, without further ado, let's get right to it with Timothy Sawyer. Tim Sawyer, welcome to the David versus Goliath podcast. Great to be here, Adam. Thanks for having me today, man. Great to see you. It, it, it's great to see you too. And for the watchers and listeners, Tim and I met, it feels like a couple of decades ago, but our daughters, Brooke and Abby, were best friends growing up. And I'll never forget the day that Tim came to pick up Abby at our house in Rhode Island. We stood at the front door together. We talked for, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 minutes waiting for the kids to get ready or whatever. I closed the door and I said to my wife at the time, that is my next partner in business. And she says, <laughs> how do you know that? I said, I just know it. And uh, Tim's been my business partner for years, still is. We still own yep. some things together. We don't actively work together anymore, but we still own some things together. And Tim, what I love about your story is like where you came from. You know, I'd like you to spend some time briefly, you know, I mean, a little bit of four or five minutes, a little bit about your past and how you led up to meeting me and some of the things that you've done also in your professional life prior to working together. And then some of the things you did together with me. Yeah. So um, 
depending on how far you want to go back, I'm actually working on a, a cool project right now. Um, I'm in the middle of, of a book and should be done well, three or four weeks. And um, so, as you know, uh, for me, success in life uh, is never a permanent state and it's not a certainly not a straight line. Right. And so I uh, dealt with some stuff as a kid and I thought it was important to share that with folks. So the, the book um, is going to be uh, No More Hiding, The Tale of Two Beasts. And it's based on the, the Navajo proverb, as you know, that suggests we all have two beasts inside of us. One represents all things that are great. One represents all things that are bad. And the grandson says to the grandfather, which, how do you know which one wins? And he says, it's the one I feed the most. And so in my life, I've had certainly given in to both, right? I, I fed both beasts at different times and, and reaped the benefits at certain times and paid the cost at other times when I fed the wrong one. So that's really fun. I'm working on that. So um, obviously spent a little time um, uh, in, I spent one year, learned the most. This will come out in the book, page one, one year in a residential rehab, grew up more than, more there than I did anywhere else, got my GED in rehab, then went on to Bryant University, worked, spent 12 years uh, working in a federal savings bank right here in Rhode Island. Um, and also I'll mention in the book that I had the blessing of, of meeting you uh, in 2000 at the tail end of working at uh, the bank. And you were getting ready to uh, wind down your third business at that time. And uh, we spoke about uh, putting putting a deal together. And so we spent seven, spent seven years in the insurance industry, sold that to a private equity firm, uh, started Crystal Clear, which is still going, by the way. Uh, now Patient Now sold that, obviously, together and was grateful for that. Uh, currently, I am doing some work for them. I still work with some of the clients. I still do some some podcast work. Uh, and what I'm up to now for the last six months or so is I'm actually working with high school kids on a couple different fronts. One is helping people understand that they're not less than if they decide to go to trade school or no school and just go get a job. Uh, that's a huge, huge problem in our workforce right now is we make kids feel like they have to go borrow $150,000 to go to college. Then they only go for three years. They end up with a $70,000 loan. And it's a real problem. Uh, student loan debt is the second highest debt in the country, more than credit cards, $1.7 trillion in student loan debt. It's crisis level. So I'm doing work uh, with a group called Strack Institute. They offer electronic certifications for kids, helping them. Uh, and then I do a lot of volunteer work with high school kids working on personal finance and teaching entrepreneurial skills. Uh, and we're in the process of launching a company called Spark Money IQ which we will be teaching three really cool, uh, three really cool workshops. One is around personal finance. So how do you spend your money on a daily basis? The, the, the cost of coffee and the cost of gas and the cost, cost of car insurance. How do you get a credit card? Uh, huge, huge, huge gap in the educational system right now. Only 21 states require any type of financial training for high school kids at all. Uh, so the second piece of that is going to be Business, talk about the business model that uh, you developed so many years ago. We're going to take kids uh, at their level around the wheel, right? Find, sell, keep. So every business has to do three things, right? So we'll talk about basic sales and marketing skills, and then actually going to use Crystal Clear in the third module as a case study for how to start a business, how to raise money, and and, uh, and then give the kids a little test at the end. And, um, and that'll all be sitting under my new business, which is Profit for Intent. So what I've decided, Adam, is going forward, I'm going to do, it's got to have two criteria for me to get involved. It's got to be a financial component, meaning somebody can make some money, and it's got to be for good, doing something for good. So that's where I'm at now. And you know, and I think, I, I think for the listeners and the watchers, it's a li you're, you're not quite telling the whole story of your past, obviously, and I think we're going to save a lot of that for the book. I will, I promise you. Listeners and watchers, when this book comes out, you've got to read at least the first few chapters because it'll blow you away. <laughs> the first page. <laughs> the first page. Uh, when you realize where Tim has come and where he is now and where he's going, it's awesome. Now, Tim, when you worked at um, the, the the Federal Savings Bank, I think it's important for people to understand, like you ran an entire call center dedicated to helping people get second mortgages. Yep. And you ran it like a machine. Like you learned a lot about hiring, recruiting, training, developing and mentoring a team back then. 
which led you to all that life experience that you brought into Astonish at the time. Yep. And then all that life experience brought into Crystal Clear, which is now Patient Now, because Patient Now acquired us. I know you're still working with Patient Now, and that's awesome. We both still uh, have financial interest in Patient Now, which is exciting. And at the end of the day, when you think about the thousands of people that you've worked with over the years, how did you, what did you learn specifically in that first job that you had in managing that many people? How many people did you manage? How'd you recruit them? How'd you train them? I think people would love to hear that. Yeah. So we had, um, we had about a hundred telemarketers and I, I spent a little time on that, not a ton. I spent more time on the loan officer side. So just for your listeners to understand, the bank's business model was uh, mail solicitation. So send out a solicitation across the country, across the US, suggesting that people can lower their credit card debt, refinance their mortgage uh, and, and save money. So when I came to the bank, there weren't a lot of systems in place. There was no training. Anybody could work there. You could, there was no background required. There was, uh, it was kind of a free for all. Doing great, but it was a free for all. And so um, my third year there as a loan officer working on the phone, um, I realized that there was a better way to do it. And this is an actually really exciting part of my life where I had, when I, because of some of my life experiences as a teenager, I had really low self-esteem going into the workforce and I had a paralyzing fear of public speaking. And which is why I took a job for two reasons. One, I had a criminal record and the other, they had no background checks. And the second one was I got to work on the phone. So I didn't have to see people face to face. So it solved two problems. And, um, and you know, 20, 23 years old. And so I learned real quick that I was really good at, at selling, but I was also good at mentoring. In other words, people would just naturally kind of gravitate towards me. Hey, can you walk me through this? And I really wanted to train people. I had this passion to train people, as you know. And problem was to train people means you got to get up in front of the room and, and give a talk. And I was terrible at that. So at the time, I went to see a psychiatrist in Providence, told him about this fear. And he said, OK, you've got this physiological response going on, Tim. Yep. So as soon as you think about public speaking, you get sweaty and you, you get prickly and you you know, and everything goes wrong. And I actually, my wife hates us because she does, uh, she adverse to any type of pills because of her, the work that she does. Uh, bottom line is the guy gave me a pill and he said, 45 minutes before you speak, take this pill and it'll slow down that physiological response. So I did it. And for all the crazy that the owner of that bank was, the first time I gave a talk, the words were great. But I had big pit stains and sweat and nervous and anxiety. And I thought I was dead as a public speaker, never was going to speak again. And he came up to me after we were talking. He goes, oh, boy, that, you know, <laughs> didn't go too great. And I said, no. And he goes, well, when do you think you're going to do it again? <laughs> and I was like, wow. And so he gave me another shot. So my passion for training I parlayed that into being the corporate trainer, the corporate recruiter, then the guy who goes to colleges and then putting systems in place that said, OK, let's guarantee these kids a certain amount of income because at, at 21, you're recruiting the parent. You're not recruiting the kid. Right. So the kid's got to be able to go back to his dad and say, well, I'm guaranteed forty one thousand dollars a year. OK, that's a good job, son. You should take it or daughter. Uh, and so we put systems in place and then we focused a lot on the 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 thinking around how to move someone, as you like to say, from red lights to yellow lights to green lights, right? What are the words that you use? How do you string those sentences together? How do you overcome common objections? And we drilled on that like freaks. And so once we put the training in place, a loan officer used to be, we had the worst system in the world, Adam, because if you were a great telemarketer, you got promoted to loan officer, which always meant we had the shittiest telemarketers. <laughs> So I stopped that and said, if they're a good, a good telemarketer, let them freaking telemarket. Yeah. And so I said, let's hire people as loan officers. Don't put them in the call center. We'll train them on our own. So we did a lot of role playing. And then the way they had to test out is they had to sell me a mortgage. And so we'd be in, they'd be in a classroom for 10 to 12 weeks. They'd get certified. Uh, and then once they hit the floor, they were up and running. So we got put some parameters in place around, hey, we were looking for a certain kind of background, you know, a kid who played sports and had some debt and, you know, was a fighter, that kind of thing. And we just turned that thing into a freaking machine. Um, and then, of course, I, I had the greatest manual in the world, stole it, got sued and sorted it all out. It's fine. 
<laughs> we'll segue. We'll segue with the, uh, the next segment. I, I think this is important, though, to stop for a second. You said something really profound. You know, you're teaching people how to have people that have red lights in their mind turn them to yellow, and then ultimately to green to move them to that next step. Even in your own life, you had a red light when it came to something. You sought some help, turned to a yellow. First one didn't go so good. You probably never would have done it again unless he saw something in you. He said, hey, you know what? You got to get back out there and do it. The more you do it, the more you do it, the better, easier it becomes. Life's a funny thing, though, man. You know, life is very cyclical. Things come back. They go away. They come back. I mean, it's the nature of all of our, our beasts and demons that we deal with. But one of the things that I think is important for the watchers and listeners to know is not only did you manage that large group of people in that team, not only were you doing public speaking, but when you came to Astonish, that led naturally to you helping us build a sales force and then ultimately build a training division, create the entire training manuals as to what an insurance agency at the time should be doing to help them find, serve, and keep more customers. Everything from marketing to the way they answer the phone to their people in process. Tell the listeners and the watchers, you know, because you've worked with a lot of trainers, you've done a lot of public speaking. If you were looking, what is the one thing you would tell a small business owner that if they don't have in their business right now, they're in no danger of growing? What would that one thing be when it comes to training? Well, from a, it would start with a technology, and I'm learning to appreciate that more right now, right? Obviously, having some way to manage client lists beyond a spreadsheet is super important, right? And so having some type of CRM tool, obviously, Anthem has that, and I, I, I use it myself. I recommend it. Um, that would be the one piece of technology. But depending upon if it, you know, there's a lot of different types of businesses. So if you're talking about, you know, a retail store selling cigarettes and stuff, that's something different than a tech startup, right? But if any anything outside of a mom and pop, um, you know, retail store, people coming in buying alcohol and cigarettes, it, it, it starts with, you know, who's your customer, but then it's the value prop, right? What's the value prop? So if you're a landscaper, why should someone hire you to mow their lawn or, or trim their trees? Um, and, and you taught me something a long time ago. I'll never forget it. And that's everything speaks, right? So even if you just want to, not just, but if you want to have a landscaping business making $100,000 a year, there's certain things that need to go into that, right? So there's the marketing piece of it. There's the website and there's what you email the community or what you drop in the mailboxes to solicit business. But then there's also... What do you say when that person calls, right? And it's got to be a uniform approach to that. So if, if it's just a husband and wife, husband and wife are saying the same stuff, right? And, and why should they hire you? And I, and I think every business needs to start with that. We're working on that at Spark Money IQ right now. Why should someone pay us to come speak at their school? I, I think, you know, there's a lot of people that provide financial education. Why should they pick us? I, I think that that's, that's a huge thing. And then how you telegraph that, to the public, right? There's there's a lot that goes into that. And so I think anybody that wants to deliberately build a business, meaning they don't just want to bump into stuff and someday get some money, that they deliberately want to build a business, it's got to start with what makes you unique. It's got to start with having the right technology in place um, and then getting everybody on the same page. And if they do that, they got a good shot at a, at a small brand and making some money. There's no doubt about it. Now, Tim, we got to take a quick break from a corporate sponsor here at Anthem Software. When we get back, though, I want to talk to you about something that's very personal to you, and I think we'll have a lot of fun doing it. So listeners, watchers, you're with Tim Sawyer. I'm Adam DeGrade. This is David versus Goliath. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Anthem Business Software System is designed to specifically help small businesses just like yours find, serve, and keep more customers profitably. We do this by providing you with the most powerful software, automations, and marketing services to help your business compete and win in this ever-changing digital world. Take a short video tour at AnthemSoftware.com. Tim Sawyer, once again, Tim, welcome to DVG. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is great. It is. It's a lot of fun. 
I love your background. That's a cool studio. There's no doubt about it, man. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And you were a big part of me being able to afford it because uh, <laughs> over the years, Tim and I have worked together in several businesses. We've had several successful exits together. Cheers to us. And it's been awesome. So part of this background is because of Tim Sawyer, part of your background where you spend a lot of time, you've recently taken up kayaking quite a bit. As a matter of fact, we're going to be showing some pictures right now on the screen of Tim kayaking. Tim, tell a little bit, the listeners, a little bit about your your haven. It's become a haven for you, right? <laughs> yeah. So fortunately, um, it's been my wife and I's dream. We've lived in uh, North Kingstown, Rhode Island for over 20 years. And uh, North Kingstown is situated on the water um, across from Jamestown. And we've always wanted to live on the water. And so... Um, you know, we saved a little bit. And of course, a lot of congratulations to you and thank you to you. Uh, we were fortunate enough in our most recent transaction to feel comfortable uh, to go ahead and pull the trigger on a waterfront property. So uh, I'm actually, as you can see, I'm sitting, this is the top floor of my house. It's actually a fully functioning pub in the back with a commercial kitchen and uh, a dumb waiter that goes from the catering area to the basement up here so that people make the food down, shoot it up, and there you go. And uh, so, but it literally sits on the Atlantic Ocean. And so, uh, actually, as I look out right now, I can see uh, about a quarter of a mile out from the shore, there's, uh, the, they're called the Seven Sisters. They're rocks. And from October, that protrude from the water, from October to May, they're filled with seals. So on any given day, there would be up to a hundred seals out there. So I like, it's really cool. Although you ruin it for people. It's, and what I mean by that is this, it's kind of like a local spot where guys will bring their kids. And I was like that jerk idiot, new guy on the street, didn't realize what I was doing. And I would literally paddle my kayak and go right through the rocks. And what it does is it scatters the seals, which is great because the seals bob up and down for half an hour and you can get the greatest pictures in the world. Problem is they don't come back that day. So everybody that's driving down in the afternoon to watch the seals is going to sit there and look at a bunch of bare rocks screaming shit at me from the shore and uh, won't repeat what they say in front of their kids. So I, was, I kind of started to put together, I'm like, that's not a good thing. So you got to respect the seals a little bit. And um, But, yeah, it's cool. And we've got a little boat out here and go water skiing and stuff. And it, that's it, awesome. It's been, been a dream of mine. Yeah, it's cool. It's, it's, great, to see, it's great to see you doing it. And, and for the watchers and listeners, this stuff doesn't happen on accident. You know, Tim's – busted his butt for years, man, traveled around the country. As a matter of fact, I think, Tim, you were speaking. At one, what was the most amount of public speeches you gave for Crystal Clear in one year? Do you remember that actual number? 2019 was 42. Wow, 42. Now, just think about that, guys. 42 weekends. And these shows that you went and spoke at were not just like one-day events. They were two, three, four, five-day events. So you add that on top of it. No wonder you spent a lot of time out there with the SEALs. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because um, I was looking at this the other day because I was putting together my, um, you know, and this is a good point for people to get, right, which is that, again, if you want to be deliberate in growing a business, there's trade-offs too, right? There's things that you're going to have to sacrifice to get what yeah. you want. There's no doubt about that. Um, but we were able to take, and, and we had a gal working for us by the name of Audrey who was really good at this, and get – uh, on the programs as faculty. So I was looking at it. Right now, I have 36 faculty designations in elective medicine. So what that means is instead of us having to pay to speak, the doctors get continuing education credit to listen to us speak. And That's that was amazing. a big pivot for us because speaking is expensive in elective medicine. But if you can convert those into unpaid CME or continuing education, that's where you get real credibility in that space. And so, yeah, but it wasn't you know, if you don't have a great product, if you don't have a great financial person and Crystal and you don't have uh, great service people and if you don't have passion for the business, you can be the greatest public speaker in the world. It's, nothing's going to happen. Yeah. Right? It, it takes, yeah. takes good, good partners that work diligently and it's people who believe it's their life. Right. It becomes your life. It's interesting because when I, I remember when Tim gave his first speech with me, I'll never forget it. We were in uh, Palm Springs. And, uh, and, and you were sitting at the table and you got, you had a little bit of the flashback to nervousness, which by the way, yeah, as you know, I was scared. Forget about nervous. I was flat out scared. 
And it's funny because as you know, later in life, that switched for me having that issue, which has really been weird for me because I never had that issue. Um, but it's, I've been coming out on the other side of that too, which is really great. But I'll never forget looking over at Tim and you weren't eating the chicken. And I'm like, Tim, are you all right? And you're like, no, I'm not okay. <laughs> I said, whatever you do. <laughs> do you remember the advice I gave you? Yep. What was it? Follow my energy. I said, match my energy. And man, did you match it? And I remember uh, that was the craziest speech of the world because after my talk, I remember I walked out with my briefcase right after my session. You came on, you continued the energy. But when I watched back on that video, there was something that Tim did because Tim doesn't just, and this is important for those of you thinking about bringing Tim in to speak at high schools and to these students. Tim doesn't just teach people and educate people and train them. He wants to call greatness out of them. So I'll never forget Tim at the end of his talk, getting on his hands and knees and begging these insurance agents at the time to heed what we were telling them. Because it literally was the difference in them being stagnant and shrinking or being uh, expansive and growing. And you said to them, I'm begging you, I'm begging you. And that became a signature feature of a lot of your talks, not all of them, but many of the talks, there's usually a, an ending that Tim Sawyer brings to the table that is unforgettable. I promise you that. And uh, it was always awesome, man, to watch you take control of a room. Most importantly, to really care. Because I think when you share the truths that you and I have learned over the years about people, process, tools, right? Courage, belief, like all these things we talk about. When you're up there and you're portraying that to somebody, you're hoping it's translated. Like right now, you're watching this podcast, and I'm hoping that my energy and Tim's energy is translating to you so that you can get up today and be the best you can be, right? So Tim, when you, when you do, when you prepare for public speeches, even the ones that you've given routinely over and over again, you have a routine that you do beforehand. But when you're in the moment and you're on at, at the end of it, when you've been on your knees and you've been imploring to people, what are you hoping happens to that business owner? And you and I have seen it, right? We've talked about it for years. So often we felt like we want their success more than they want their success. And I know your heart has always been to, this isn't just about me giving a talk. This is about you being successful by heeding what we're saying. When you're finishing that talk, what do you hope happens in the mind and the heart? And most importantly, the actions of that business owner or that guy or gal now who's in high school and they're getting ready to enter the workforce. It's so the, uh, the way I respond to that, it's, it's before you go into the room, and I, I believe that you were the one that gave me this concept, and I've talked about it a lot, is before you give a talk to anybody, you have to ask yourself, what do I want these people to think? What do I want them to feel? And most importantly, when it's over, what do I want them to do? And when you're doing the type of speaking that, that we were doing, this, it's a dual purpose, right? It's education, but it's also education and get them to come to the booth. Right. So okay. and if in, in modern marketing, if people feel a sense of you're not being authentic, you're trying to manipulate them, you'll be in trouble. Right. Because they'll see most people will see through that. And so it, it starts with a genuine, genuine intent to help them. Right. And I'll say that, listen, you, you don't have to come by the booth or buy anything, but just do this. Right. And it's really caring and you know, if you go back in life, where does that come from, right? First of all, getting banged up as a kid, right? I have an appreciation for what it means to be, you know, not in the great spot, to not have money, to have your freedom denied, to have, I'm aware of all those things, which is great because in business, you get a big tough guy who threatens you to sue you. I'm like, you're going to mail me something? You send me something in the mail? I've had my freedom denied. You know, it's like, I'm not afraid of you. So, you know, that, that helps, certainly. But in terms of wanting to help people, it's like, I understand that it is hard, right? It's hard to go from A to B. And so if there's something that that we can, one little thing that you can motivate that person to do, even if it has nothing to do with what we're talking about or selling, that they all have these two or three things. This, this is how I'll answer the question succinctly. They all have two or three things that they know they need to do that have been sitting on a desk or in a drawer or in their car and they need to do something with that, whatever it is, just to get them to do that one thing, to go, okay, to get me to advance the ball from here to here, 
Just go do that. And if they just see that we care about them and we want to help them and they go, you know what? If that guy can do it, I can do it too. And it's relatability. And if they, if they, if they relate to you and they, they think you're genuine, then those person, those people will be moved. Right. Mm-hmm. And in my career, that's how I keep score now. It's like, did I, did, did I connect with that person? Did I move them to do? Um, and it will be liberating in this, this next uh, round of learning education, because not every talk I'm going to give will have a profit motive, which is a, um, you know, you're just inspiring people to make change without buying anything from you. And that's, <laughs> you know, that, that will, that's a twist. It, it, it is a twist, but you're going to be great at it, man. It's a, you know, it's, it's fascinating. I remember, I think there was one speech you actually said something where you said, you know, a hundred of you are raising your hand right now. Next year, when the hundred of you come back to this event, the sad reality is only 10% of you will have actually done something with what I'm saying. And 90% of you will be in the exact same place you were when you came in before this talk, having the exact same problems, the exact same concerns. And my implore you to not be a part of that 90%. And I think that's so profound in life for all of us, right? Is that you could only speak to the listening of somebody. You know, when I took expository preaching classes years ago when I was going to be a, a pastor, one of the things I learned is that you try to keep something under 22 minutes if you're giving like an actual speech, because after that, you've lost so many people. Within 35 seconds, Tim, of somebody hearing you speak for the first time or me speak for the first time, they either, they judged us. They either like yeah. us or not. So, self, you know, self-defacing humor has always been good. I always tell people, you know, which which one of you 65% of people or 35% of people don't like me? Cause that kind of like breaks the ice a little bit, you know, some hands go up, hands go up, yep. you know, I actually don't like you and that's okay. In order to be loved, you have to be equally hated. My brother's taught me that. And at the end of the day, when you're trying to change people's thinking and behavior and, and, and the fact that we all know we're creatures of habit, you have to do something, right? I've been saying on the show and David versus Goliath that action is the life of an entrepreneur, but hesitancy is the death of an entrepreneur. And what I love with what you're doing right now with what you're about to do is you're stepping out into the unknown, which takes a lot of courage, Tim, to do this next stage. We got to take another break from another sponsor. But when we come back, I want to talk to you about that courage of how you get up every single day and say, I'm going to go change the world today and, and how you're going to muster up the energy to have a nonprofit motive in this, which is going to be fascinating. I want to hear all about that. But you're listening to Tim Sawyer. You're listening to Adam DeGrade. This is David versus Goliath, the greatest small business podcast in the world. You get better advice here than just about anywhere else. Everyone knows it. Anybody who watches this show knows it. You know it. You can feel it. I feel it every time. I'm so grateful to have Tim Sawyer. Stay tuned for another important message from another great sponsor right here on David versus Goliath. We'll be right back. Northeast Capital has an exciting new program we offer to equipment and software dealers. It provides you the appearance of a private label captive financing program. We call it Our Financial Services. Using Our Financial Services, you can offer your customers your own financing program, including industry-specific payment calculators and unique payment options. Northeast Capital administers a private label program tailored to you and your customers' needs. Learn how we can help you reduce receivables and qualify for your own private label finance program. Tim Sawyer, amazing entrepreneur, great business partner, amazing motivational speaker, trainer, educator, father, philanthropist. What else do you do? I mean, you're amazing. It's unbelievable. It's so great to have you on the show. I want to shift now to something that I love to talk about. I believe that David, even though he had five smooth stones, it only took one to slay that giant, Tim. And I call that stone in business called courage. 
So as you looked at your life transitioning, you've had some successful businesses, successful exits, and now you want to start giving back in life. You want to bring education to places where you believe there's a lack of this particular thing and uh, in this market. Tell people about the courage it takes to, A, start this business, and then to get you up every day, get out there, create the curriculum, and then go make it happen. Uh, you know what's funny? It's a little tougher right now, and I'm, I, I don't say this because I'm on your podcast. Doing it alone, so I don't have a business partner in this, doing, the, doing it alone is definitely a different twist because it's all self-motivation. Mm. And what I'm learning is about myself is that I'm much better when I feel like I, if I don't do it, I'm going to let somebody else down, mm. if that makes sense, right? So finding the courage right now is actually um, – so I, I, I meet twice a week with high school kids, and we, we're actually working on the curriculum together. The kids are doing it. Um, and so what I've had to do – is to, in my brain, say, you know what, Tim, you're doing this as much for them and as much for the kids you're going to help as you are for yourself, right? And so, in other words, I've got to create this purpose beyond, hey, maybe we can go get a little bit of money and and help people, right? Which is not insignificant, don't get me wrong, uh, but definitely harder go, going alone. And so, um, I, I need to start surrounding myself, and there, there are some great administrators that I'm working with now that are getting super excited. I actually had a, a, a guy tell me the other day um, that I sparked, this is a, a 30 year administrator, principal teacher, guidance counselor. He said, I sparked, um, uh, I sparked an entrepreneurial itch in him that he didn't realize he had and that he spent 15 hours the other day working on curriculum that he wants to share and, and do some stuff together to supplement the work that he's doing as an administrator. And I was like, okay, now you start to see, that's the hardest thing is connecting, okay, my energy, my courage, my motivation with, okay, now it's starting to make a difference. And that is what, that's my fuel. As soon as I see, hey, wait, other people are gonna benefit from this too. It's not yeah. just me. Trying to, it's connecting those dots and, um, so it, it's it's different, and I'm sure I'll sort that out pretty quick. But uh, it's an exciting time in my life, man. And, and, and it's, it's for the first time I feel like I have a little bit of time to do what I've always wanted to do, but have been so hyper focused on. I mean, you know, you live a lopsided life. If you're trying to get a business to be worth more than other businesses, you can get. For me, anyways, your life can get out of whack. Totally. And so, what, yeah, totally. And, and so um, now trying to focus on the courage to get up and do it, whether it's myself or, or developing partners, um, but it's also having balance so that you do have time to, you know, I, I don't want to let this next thing consume me, I guess would be my, because uh, I'm an addict at everything. So it's all McDonald's. <laughs> You know, it's it's interesting you said you said something fascinating there, that you felt the pressure in the past to do it for others. You yeah. know, I think one of the things I'll tell you and just give you a little insight, uh, maybe this might help you, maybe it won't. You said something fascinating. Um, years ago, I thought about this, that God gives us each unique gifts and talents, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's a purpose and a reason why we're here. And it's bigger than just ourselves in our immediate sphere of influence, I believe. And for me not to use my gifts, that whether that's music or storytelling or, spe or speaking or advising or leading, would be to rob not just myself of what I was made for, but others that I was given that gift to benefit. And so you've been given amazing gifts. You're very real, as people can tell. You're down to earth. You're rough around the edges. But that makes you beautiful because you're not so polished. You know, everything and everything that's polished can be sometimes fake, right? And, and, and you're very real. And I think when you go to speak to these kids, Tim, and you share with them from the heart, the gift that you've been given to share with them is not just to fulfill yourself and reward yourself. For you not to do it would be stealing from them. And I think if you see it that way, when your eyes open up in the morning, 
You can say, I got to get to work because people still need me. It's a different way, but they might need you even more than somebody else might need you that you think might need you now and give your time to them and your attention to them. So that's my encouragement to you. I think- You way to look at it. Yeah, I, I, you know, I just, it's one of the things that I have to tell myself every day too, right? Because, you know, how many times can I run the bases? Well, if I didn't run the bases, I don't know what else I'd be doing. Right. And so it's, so it's kind of like I was born for a purpose. I want to make sure that when I, when I leave planet Earth, that I've done everything I can in my power, with God's help, I believe, to help me fulfill that purpose. And I think you're doing the same thing. And so kudos to you. Now, Tim, you've got great advice for people. You've given amazing advice to people. You've sat multiple business owners in a room once and actually asked them, so which one of you people are in charge? Because it seems like nobody's in charge. And if nobody's in charge, if, if all of you are in charge, there's nobody in charge and nothing's going on. But right now we have an aspiring entrepreneur, man or woman, or a successful business that's struggling or a business that's struggling to get off the ground successfully. What is the one piece of advice that you would tell them that if they implemented this in their lives, it would make the biggest difference for them. Take inventory and be brutally honest with yourself. That's the hardest thing to do is to, and we've, you know, for a a young, a young entrepreneur starting your business. One of the things that I I suggest and, and talk about in speeches all the time is Acting like your business is for sale, right? You and I were both very good at that. And so whether it's, a, like I said, a landscaper or a dentist or whatever, ask yourself, if you were going to buy that business from yourself, what would make you nervous about doing that? <laughs> exactly. That's how you take inventory. And you go, well, I wouldn't like the fact that we don't have this and I wouldn't like the fact that we don't have that. So once you've taken inventory, Once you're brutally honest with yourself about what needs to be fixed, then set about the task of fixing those things. And and like Adam's mom told him, how do you clean a room? One corner at a time, right? So it can it can feel overwhelming if you go, Hey, there's 20 things wrong with my little business or my big business. Uh, and that's, that usually is the case, right? There's no business that's perfect. And so once you take inventory, once you're brutally honest with yourself, then set the task, make a list. Start knocking those things out. Don't procrastinate about it. Mm. Uh, because if you've got 20 things wrong in six months, you'll have 25 unless you start working on the 20 you got wrong now. And I, I think what a lot of people do is they let things they know, right, at a conscious level that things need to be fixed, but they just don't do it. You know, it's like if I don't look at it, it'll go away. And in business, guys, that's not how it works. It never goes away. It gets worse. And so it always gets it always worse. It's worse, right? And we're and we're living in messed up times too, right? I mean, forget about your political affiliation or whatever. You know, in my business alone, Adam, I, I want to get into the schools, right? What's delaying that? The freaking government's all freaked out, the world's all freaked out, and about, you know, whatever you think aside, right? Well, that's a thing that I've got to deal with. And so if that throws my business, uh, and it has, right? It's a monkey wrench in my business. I can't get into those schools right away. So what are we going to do? We'll create virtual modules, right? I got to look at this brutally and say, okay, that's what we're going to have to do, right? And so that's my encouragement is just to be brutally honest and, um, you know, tell yourself you're doing good. That's fine. But you got to have one hairy eyeball on your business at all times. (laughs) <laughs> That's the greatest slide. That's going to be the name of this episode, by the way. One hairy eyeball. That's gonna, <laughs> you got to have one hairy eyeball on your business, folks. You got to take inventory. Don't bury your head in the sand. Look at things for what they are and always begin with the end in mind, which is to Tim's point. If you're building a business that one day you want to sell or even hand down, what would you them, what would you want? fixed. If you were to buy it, fix it now. Don't wait because today is the only day that matters. Yesterday's gone. Tomorrow is not here yet. The only change that can happen is right now. And you've been on watching the David versus Goliath podcast with my guest, Tim Sawyer. Tim, have you had a good time so far today? I've had a blast. This is great. Congratulations on the podcast. Congratulations on your new children's book. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Good segue. Hold on. 
right here. There it is, The Adventures of Jackson. Tim, I don't know. You probably never even heard this story, but it's a pretty cool story. It's right here, The Adventures of Jackson. I'll be, I'll be checking it out. I think that's awesome. Congratulations on all of your success, Tim. We wish you the best. People can check you out at timsawyer.com, correct? Spark Money IQ will take you there. S-P-A-R-K Money IQ.com. Give us a look. If you know, a little quick plug. If you know someone, uh, if you're a mom or dad, own a business and you got high school kids and you're concerned about their financial IQ, uh, it's not taught. It's ignored a ton. Uh, we make it fun. I would be grateful to have the opportunity to come out to your school, spend some time with with your kids and their friends and, and get them all fired up about money, how money works. We'd love to do that. So I'm grateful. Check us out. SparkMoneyIQ.com. I love it. Spark Money IQ. There's your, there's your pimp out, Tim. Great job. Everyone, I'm your host, Adam DeGrade. That was Tim Sawyer. Another amazing edition of David versus Goliath is in the can. Stay tuned next week. It's going to get better and better as we go along. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone have a fantastic day.